Keith Livingston here. Today we're talking with Trevor Vincent, Mr. Running, in the second interview about training, uh, how he trained and how he trains youngsters he's helping today. The state of the nation with the runners coming through in Australia right now, like um, obviously training standards have changed over the years and, and thoughts on training have changed over the years, but what, in your opinion, of all your experience, is the main thing? I think there's a couple of things that um, the main thing is probably consistency and and just building up gradually. I, I believe in um, uh, yeah, a sort of a system that's that uh, covers a range of different sort of sessions. So that, you know, you've got a balanced session during a balanced um, program, but the main thing is consistency and trying to get out regularly. The more often the better and not racing all the time not running hard all the time but a balance between faster and slower running including hills um, and different hills long long run sort of longer runs over a range of hills or just short hill sessions and then depending on the time of year um, well most of the, all the year you'd probably do some sort of faster work but getting into and during the track season you'd have a couple of days you'd be doing track work um, and um, so, yeah, I, I believe in um, trying to develop the athletes. So if I see someone who comes along, say, through my Monash group, and that's where, the you know, you get see a range of athletes, um, I can usually pick the ones out that are not just the ones that have shown potential to be great runners, but the ones who enjoy their running and, and could go on and make good club runners. Um, and so they're the ones that I sort of target a little bit, but I help everyone else. Um, but, uh, so, yeah, I like to make sure that they don't all of a sudden hop into doing two-hour runs on Sunday and, uh, and you know, 100, 100 and 100K a week very quickly. So it's just got to be a slow process to build them up. Um, so that's where I come from. I think that um, the sorts of things that I think are pretty important is to have a, a nice environment to run in. So you've got to enjoy your running. So I think that um, there's been athletes in the past who have been very successful but probably didn't enjoy their running as much as they should and probably didn't go on with their career as long as they should or as long as they could have. Um, but if you're in a situation where you're in a, in a, a group um, and with a range of abilities, people you can run with, some, you know, at your own pace, uh, sometimes it's a good influence on you to run a little bit quicker and sometimes a little bit, bit slower. Um, but, yeah, I think we've just got to try and uh, get them consistent uh, develop them slowly, uh, do our sessions during the week, a range of different things. Um, in my early days, um, the my emphasis was on track training and not many people would, I don't think anyone ever ran in the, in the hills or, you know, would do much outside a track, although there weren't many tracks, but, you know, on the grass or whatever, but it would be mainly faster work and not very long runs. And uh, so, yeah, I think that that's the important thing, try to, be consistent, get up to run regularly. Um, and if it's the important, you know, if you're doing other sports, it's hard to concentrate on one. I like to see people sort of do other than, you know, I mean, running can't be part of your life. Well, it can be part of your life, but not dominate it. So you've just got to get a balance between what you're doing in the way of comp training, what you're doing in the way of competition, other other activities you might do to support your running, like stretching and weights and all this sort of thing. So it can be a um, pretty complex sort of um, thing to handle, and as well as all that, you're still trying to do normal things like family involvements and work. On that subject, uh, a sort of myth crept into uh, training um, philosophy that you couldn't train like a full-time athlete while you're working full-time. So you can uh, dispute that pretty well because what did you do during your running career work-wise? Quite a bit, really. Oh, yeah. No, I was, I was full-time work. I had a family at fairly young. It's just a matter of, you know, and I mean, you've just got to be a bit more specific about what you do and stick to stick to try, um, schedules. Um. And yeah, it's it's pretty hard to get out and tr you know do lots of running during the week when you've got other priorities. But I managed to balance it, and so did others. Like 
you know, all the others in those days. I think even Herb Elliott worked and uh, John Landy certainly did. And so we're going back in those real old days. Um, and uh, nowadays, there's, yeah, there's quite a few that make the, that athletics is their full-time job. But, I mean, that's pretty impossible to do for just about everybody because there's not, you need income. And uh, it's not a sport that gets much coverage in the newspapers or on television. I mean, back in the actually 50s and 60s and earlier, there was a lot of coverage, huge coverage in the newspapers. Um, and even our club competition on Saturdays would be covered that set that night. That night, and a couple of men, you know, set their papers. And on Monday, the following. But even then, even though there was good coverage, I suppose it was before television, um, or around the time of the early days of television in the 50s, there still wasn't money around for people to become full-time athletes. There is a bit now, but still not much. Certainly hard in Australia. So I think that um, trying to balance your whole life is hard. It's, uh, you see what's happening in Africa. Um, running and distance running particularly has um, made a big difference to a lot of the African, Kenyan, and Ethiopian runners because they're able to make a living out of it. And in fact, the, the big money available in some of the major races, marathons, um, that uh, they, they win or get a you know, big prize money in one of those, that's enough to keep them going for life. Listening, you know, listening to your body or just... Um, not trying to overdo it, have a have hard day, hard, easy day, sort of not necessarily alternative hard, easy, but make sure there's a split between hard and easy days. And that, I refer just hard, easy, not just to the fact that you're running hard, but the courses might be a bit easier, run on grass, um, flat courses. So I made mean, a typical a typical week for a program that I'd be advocating and the distances vary and the sorts of things you do would vary, but sort of Sunday, a long, very a long run, so maximum up to two, two and a half hours probably. Wednesday, now this can vary a bit between people who do the faster work on Monday, Wednesday, but Wednesday, a long, medium long run. Um, Monday, if you've done a long run Sunday, a fairly easy, you know, 50 to 45 minutes to an hour on Monday. Track, track work on Tuesday, Thursday, one of them would be some sort of fartlek type training, um, not necessarily on the track. Um, Wednesday, medium long run. Thursday, your yeah, track. Friday, um, we used to just do something like about 30 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes easy. And that was a, re a relaxing day. And some people have a day off on, on Friday. Saturday, race. Um, and uh, in summer, well, in summer and winter, you've got the races fairly regularly, but probably more more regular in, in summer. But um, in winter, if you're racing, you know, you'd back off a little bit in the last few days, so you'd just, you know, taper. It depends on the distance of the race. Marathons are different, you know, you've got to do a specific sort of um, taper and uh, return to training for a marathon. But with track races, yeah, just back off a little bit beforehand. If, if you're not racing on the sat on the weekend, well, then you could, uh, what we normally do is, is our short hill session, and that's... um. It's on, uh, or, you know, on a softer surface, uh, dirt or grass or whatever, so a hill between two to 300 metres long. Um, running them strong up the hill and a bit like Arthur's sort of training with springing up the hills and just trying to keep upright and not a lot of, sort of a loop to get back around the bottom, um, not necessarily run straight back down the hill, but come back around and run the hill. So that one's good. Otherwise, if you... If you're not doing that hill session, you know, you, you've got the Sunday run, which can be run up to two, two and a half hours and, and over a range of different surfaces and, and range of hills and so on. But that's run at a pace that's sort of comfortable. Uh, uh, and uh, that can be good in a group. You know, just uh, it's good, you know, a long run like that passes so much easier if there's other people to run with. So that's, and I, I, yeah, I believe in... Um, in running in a group, um, yeah. The uh, the other thing that, um, or one of the other things, I that people talk about is having a second run, and uh, that's something that you can graduate into. And uh, you've just got to be careful about where and when you do the second run. But usually, you'd probably do a, a second run, <coughs> pardon me, second run early in the morning maybe that'd be a shorter run and then do a session or a longer run in the afternoon and that that's um that helps so you know so you've got to be careful as i said with the hard easy thing and listen to your body so if, if anything um 
feels a bit untoward, you back off, you, know, you drop your second session. And yeah, well, they have, need to have goals. Um, and uh, I think that uh, what I like to do is have people to, or athletes to have a, um, an idea in the back of their head about their goals, short-term, long-term goals. And not nothing too unrealistic, but, you know, at least something that gives you something to strive for. So a short-term goal would be something you'd be looking at in the next few months, 12 months, long, longer term might be, you know, I mean, a longer term aim for some who have got great ambitions might be to make an Olympic team or to, to you know, do a radio or run a particularly marathon, an international marathon somewhere if they're... Uh, what uh, are your athletes doing right now in this current situation with this... Uh COVID thing, how, how are they training or how do you maintain Yeah, okay, well, what, are, what we believe in is athletes keeping a training diary um, and in that they record a range of, well, nothing over complicated, but just a few little headings like the time, the time of the run, approximately how many kilometres they did, what they did, who they ran with, how it felt. Um, uh, so if they, you know, if they say do a session of 400s or some sort of fartlek type session, an in indication of what the pace was, um, and uh, and during these periods we can't see the athletes. Well, even when we do see them, they normally just submit their the week's training diary every week or a couple of weeks, send us along their training diary, um, so we can have a look and see what they've done, give them some comments and feedback. Uh, suggestions about what they might do to improve things or just compliment them on what they've done. Um, and I think they find that quite handy. I've still got a pile of training diaries um, that I kept back in the days. And uh, they're not so, well, they're even handy. I, I like to look at, back at them now, but at the time, and like, you know, as you're going along, if you have a, some sort of problem with an injury or, you, you know, a session that you've got some difficulty with, you can always refer back to the diary and that'll give you some indication about what happened. Um, so, you know, if you've got a, some sort of a problem with your a knee, um, if that recurs again, you can have a look back and see, well, now this happened before, what did I do about it? But I like to, um, so yeah, during this period, um, most of them are running on their own or just in, in pairs, um, but they seem to be handling it okay. Everyone seems to be getting things done. Um, and uh, oh, the other thing that we're doing is running a, uh, through the club uh, is running a, a sort of a virtual challenge event. We, we had about over 100 participate last weekend, um, and that's uh, 3K. They had a 3K run. They did a prediction about how fast they might run, and then they just put, you know submit their time. Now that was two weeks ago. We've got another one this coming weekend, which you get, they've got the option of three or 5K. Um, and uh, there's no records, um, but it's just a matter of just keeping tabs on how they're going and whether they're improving. Um, although when I say no records, we've found a few that have got out that wouldn't normally run longer distances or some of our masters runners that have actually smashed our club records because they've, you know, got out and had a go. They wouldn't, they'd probably feel a bit embarrassed running on a track race in a 3K or a 5K with all the young kids. But uh, doing this on their own, they've actually, um, we've seen some very good performances and we've seen some great runs from some of the younger kids and some of the, well, just everybody. Everyone sort of seems to be enjoying this and that's happening fairly widely, not just in Melbourne and Australia, but around the world. There's a lot of those virtual challenge races happening. I wouldn't want it yeah. to keep going for too much longer because it is nice for the athletes to get together and... Um, and part of the important one of the important things about our sport is the social side of it, and uh, it's not very social when you're doing it inside or you know just going running by your by yourself. But um, yeah, yeah, I think that 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 works all right. Yeah, and I, I think when we talk about running pace, um, it's really a matter of listening to your body about how you feel when you're doing things. So I, I believe in um, not specifically having an idea of how fast you want to run a particular, you know, a session, a circuit or whatever, rather than just listening to your body and run as you feel, but still having in mind, you know, if you wanted to run 400s in, a, say, 70 seconds, you'd have that in mind, but you wouldn't be checking your watch all the time and then being disappointed if you can't handle that because there's a range of things that can make that happen. Um, 
you know, you might be a little bit tired from the day before or you might have a particularly good day. So, you know, I think that that's, um, while we like to see the times recorded, um, it's not that important to see that. It's just a matter of them getting the sessions done and being comfortable and coming back up the next day. And in their diary, they'd record how they felt. And so if they say, so, you know, they did such and such one day and the next day they're absolutely, you know, they're, they're just worn out and tired. Well, somehow or other, they've just got to have an easier day. <coughs> That's where the hard, easy um, idea comes in. Not necessarily hard, yeah, hard one day, easy the next day, but yeah, but, but a reasonable balance of hard and easy uh, days. Trying to encourage people to pursue the sport because we love it um, and keeping an eye out for any that have got particularly, you know, particular t potential. I see, of course, you know, I, I've seen a stack of athletes in my day that have had incredible talent and just haven't gone on with it. And then others that haven't shown much but have persisted and actually produced some incredible performances. Um, so, you know, it's not, it's hard to pick in the early days. Um, and it's very disappointing when we lose people who, uh, you know, who uh, we think have got great potential but probably just might prefer to do something else and might have other priorities. And of course, the other priorities might include their studies and, and work, and they can't handle doing all those things at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, now just getting back to your story, Trevor, yeah. I remember in my early days in Victoria getting on the tram into town and then going for a lunchtime run yeah. a few, from, from Burke Street, I think it was. You, That's right. So what were you doing? You were in the public service, were you? Yeah, I was in the federal public service and we were based, yeah. in, based in various places. and. Um, it was uh, Saturday, lunchtime. We'd often go out for run at lunchtime from the city. Um, we, there was a small group, um, and we'd get changed in, the, changed in our offices, or not in the offices, but in, in the um, where the where our department was located. And we could uh, we'd be down on the town or out in the go, you know the gardens within about five or six minutes. So it was a good central location, and I mean you only had an hour for lunch, but you, by the time you got down there and um, so you had to gobble your lunch down when you got back. Um, but other than that, you know, it was good to get down the tan. You could probably do a lap of the tan, um, which is you know, about 4K. Um, so you probably get in an 8K, an easy 8K run at lunchtime. And then, you know, you'd have enough time to recover for the rest later on. And just on the way home, we'd stop and do a training session somewhere, whether it was a, on the grass or various places or from home. But, yeah, yeah. Um, you can always find time to get a run in. It's not hard. It's not like um, other sports where you've actually got to go somewhere to, you know, if you want to do swimming or tennis or whatever, you've actually got to go somewhere to do it. But with our sport, um, particularly with distance running, you can do it from wherever you like. You can uh, just go out and you can find company um, and you can find a various range of, you know, people and uh, places to run. So, yeah, and I, I think that, yeah, it's. I think with what's happening now, um, we've seen more people back out running and doing exercises. I don't know how that'll continue, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a, after a bit of a downturn, um, just while people concentrate on getting back to work rather than you know sort of joining clubs and competing. That down the track, I think we might see more people out out actively, you know, training, running um, and probably getting involved in our sport. So we've got to capitalise on that a little bit. So, you know, I think that um, some sort of promotional exercise and these virtual competitions are good. They're getting people um, who aren't normally club out, club athletes um, and their family members and so on, they're out there. So it's exposing our sport more. So, yeah. Um, I don't think this is going to cause a huge problem to the sport down the track. Um, but right at this point in time, it's just a test for the athletes to keep their training going. So they've got to keep those training diaries and uh, stay in touch, try and find someone else to run with occasionally and uh, just have those, continue to have the goals in mind. I think it's, I mean, it's pretty tough on 
at the highest level. I mean, there's athletes that had the Olympics in mind and now they've sort of, that's all gone. Um, but others that would have had marathons and, you know, the major marathons overseas have been deferred. And you've got to re, sort of rethink your program and your training. And uh, that can be pretty difficult if they're getting close to the time and within a month or two of a race and then it's all called off. But um, I think that's a test and test to the athletes and the coaches to try and come up with programs that'll have them ready for next time and maintain their interest and whatever. Um, uh, yeah. From what you've got with your ears to the ground, um, how are the uh, really very good young guys going, say, with... Nick Biddo's crew, um, those very talented kids. Yeah. How are they going at present? Are they training in Melbourne or? Yeah, yeah. From what I see, they're all around. They're just uh, training. They're, they're at home, but not training in groups. I haven't actually spoken to those people, but there's others that are. I still go to Dandenong's on a Sunday morning. Um, it's very quiet up there, but there's still a, a large, well, quite a number of people up there, and it's not a problem with this distancing because it's a huge area. Mm. But, uh, yeah, then, no, as far as I know, all those groups are still training, but um, not in large groups. We're probably using the same venues. But, um, you know, I think the thing is going along, and hopefully after the next few days or a week or two, you know, it'll come back a little bit to normal, but it's going to take quite a long time. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks, Trevor. That was Trevor Vincent. Thank you, Trevor. See ya.